physiologically speaking, are almost costless. I mean, they are not like opium or like coca, uh, cocaine, which uh, do change the state of mind, but uh, leave terrible results physiologically and morally. Mr. Huxley, in your new essays, you state that these various enemies of freedom are pushing us toward a real-life brave new world, and you say that it's awaiting us just around the corner. First of all, can you detail for us what life in this brave new world which you fear so much, or what life might be like? Well, to start with, I think this kind of the dictatorship of the future, I think will be very unlike uh, the dictatorships which we've been familiar with in the immediate past. I mean, take another book prophesying the future, uh, which was a very remarkable book, uh, George Orwell's 1984. Mm -hmm. Well, this book was written at the height of the Stalinist regime and just after the Hitler regime. And he, there he foresaw a dictatorship using entirely the methods of terror, the methods of physical violence. Uh, now, I, I think well, what is going to happen in the future is the dictators will find, as the old saying goes, that you can do everything with bayonets except sit on them. But if you want to preserve your power indefinitely, you have to get the consent of the ruled. And this they will do, partly by drugs, as I foresaw in, uh, in Brave New World, partly by these uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda. They will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man and appealing to his uh, subconscious and his uh, deeper emotions and uh, his physiology even, and so making him actually love his slavery. I mean, I think this is the danger, that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new uh, regime, but they will be happy in situations where they oughtn't to be happy. Now, but let me ask you this. You're talking about a world that could take place within the confines of a totalitarian state. Hmm. Let's become more immediate, more urgent about it. We believe, anyway, that we live in a democracy here in the United States. Do you believe that this brave new world that you talk about uh, could, let's say, in the next quarter century, the next century, could come here to our shores? I think it could. I mean, I, I, that's why I feel it's so extremely important here and now to start thinking about these problems, not to let ourselves, ourselves be taken by surprise by the and uh, new advances in technology. I mean, the, for example, in, in regard to the use of the, of the drugs, we know there's enough evidence now uh, for us to be able, on the basis of this evidence, and using a certain amount of creative imagination, to foresee the kind of uses which could be made in a, uh, by people of bad will with these things, uh, and to attempt to, to forestall this. And in the same way, I think, with these other methods of uh, propaganda, we can foresee and we can do a good deal to forestall. I mean, after all, be, um, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Is you write in Enemies of Freedom, you write specifically about the United States. You say this, writing about American political campaigns. You say, all that is needed is money and a candidate who can be coached to look sincere. Political principles and plans for specific action have come to lose most of their importance. The personality of the candidate, the way he is projected by the advertising experts, are the things that really matter. Well, this is, uh, uh, during the last campaign, there was a great deal of uh, this kind of uh, statement by the uh, advertising managers of the campaign parties, this idea that the, uh, the candidates had to be merchandised as though they were soap or toothpaste, and that you had to depend entirely on the personality. I'm, I mean, the personality is important, but there are certainly people with an extremely amiable personality, particularly on TV, who might not necessarily be very good uh, uh, in poli poli uh, positions of political trust. Well, do you feel that men like Eisenhower, Stevenson, Nixon, with knowledge of forethought, were trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the American public? Uh, no, but they were, they were being advised by powerful um, advertising agencies who were making campaigns of a quite different kind from what had been made before. And I think we shall see probably uh, all kinds of uh, new devices uh, coming into the picture. I mean, the, for example, this thing which got a good deal of publicity last autumn 
a subliminal projection. I mean, as it stands, this thing, I think, is of uh, no menace to us at the moment. But I was talking the other day to one of the people who has done most experimental work in the in psychological laboratory with this, who was saying precisely this, that it is not at the moment a danger, but once you've established a principle uh, that something works, you can be absolutely sure that the technology of it is going to improve steadily. And I mean, his view of the subject was that, uh, well, maybe they will use it to some extent in the 1960 campaign, but they will probably use it a good deal and much more effectively in the 1964 campaign, because this is the kind of rate at which technology advances. And we'll be persuaded to vote for a candidate that we do not know that we are being persuaded to vote exactly. for. Exactly. I mean, this is a rather alarming mm. feature, that you're being persuaded below the level of choice and reason. In, uh, in regard to advertising, which you mentioned just a little ago, in your writing, particularly in Enemies of Freedom, you attack Madison Avenue, which controls most of our television and radio advertising, newspaper advertising, and so forth. Why do you consistently attack the advertising uh, agency? Well, no, I, I think that uh, advertisement plays a very necessary role, but the danger, it seems to me, in a democracy is this. I mean, what does a democracy depend on? A democracy depends on the individual voter making an intelligent and rational choice for what he regards as his enlightened self-interest in any given circumstance. But what these people are doing, I mean, what both for their particular purposes for selling goods and the dictatorial um, propagandists are doing is to try to bypass the rational side of man and to appeal directly to these unconscious forces below the surface so that you are in a way making nonsense of the whole democratic procedure which is based on conscious choice of, on rational grounds. Mm -hmm. Of course, well maybe, maybe I, you have just answered this, this next question because in your essay you write about television commercials, not just political commercials, but television commercials as such. And how, as you put it, today's children walk around singing beer commercials and toothpaste commercials. And then you link this phenomenon in some way with the dangers of a dictatorship. Now, could you spell out the connection, or how do you feel that you have done so sufficiently? Well, I mean, here, okay, this whole question of children, I think, is a terribly important one, because the children are quite clearly much more suggestible than the average grown-up. And uh, again, I suppose that, uh, that for one reason or another, all the propaganda was in the hands of one or very few agencies. You would uh, have a, an extraordinarily powerful force playing on these children, who after all are going to grow up and be adults quite soon. Uh, I do think that uh, this is not an immediate threat, but it, it remains a possible threat. And you said something to the effect in your essay that the children of Europe used to be called cannon fodder, and here in the United States they are television and radio fodder. Well, uh, after all, they, you can read in the, uh, in the trade journals the most lyrical accounts of how necessary it is to get hold of the children, because then they will be loyal brand buyers later on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, again, the, you just translate this into political terms. The dictator says they will be loyal ideology buyers, when they're grown up. We hear so much about brainwashing as used by the communists. Do you see any brainwashing other than that which we've just been talking about that is used here in the United States? Other forms of brainwashing? Uh, not in the form uh, that uh, has been used in, in China and in Russia because uh, this is uh, essentially the application of propaganda methods the most violent kind to individuals. It's not a shotgun method like mm -hmm. the uh, the advertising method. It's a way of getting hold of the person and playing both on his physiology and his psychology till he really breaks down and then you can implant a new idea in his head. I mean, the descriptions of the methods are, are really blood-curdling when you, you read them. And not only the methods applied to political prisoners, but the methods applied, for example, to the training of the young communist administrators and missionaries they receive a, an incredibly tough kind of training which uh, may cause about 25% of them to break down or commit suicide but produces 75% of completely one-pointed fanatics. The question, of course, that keeps coming back to my mind is this. Obviously, politics in themselves are not evil. Television is not in itself evil. Atomic energy 